How's it going, everybody? It's Dr. Weaver with another lab walkthrough. This time we're doing the Making Connections Lab for the Living Environment. Maybe you didn't do the lab yet and you want to see what's coming up next for some help, or maybe you did it and need some extra review. Either way, stay tuned. This will be great for you. So the first thing that we do in the lab is we get the pulse rate. The pulse rate is taken at rest and then also after exercise. And when we get the pulse rate, we do it for 20 seconds because 20 seconds is one third of a minute and it just saves time. When we take the 20 second count and times it by three, that gets, gives us the pulse rate per minute. In other words, the beats per minute. We want, like any good experiment, we want to do three times. So we do three trials and we get an average. To get the average, we add up all three trials, divide by three, and boom, we got our average. So then what we have is our class data. Our class data can be organized in a histogram. A histogram is a really cool way to show a data table, especially when you're tallying the number of individuals. It looks kind of like a bar graph, and histograms tally different individuals that are organized into different categories. So these different categories are actually pulse rate ranges. So an average pulse rate range, for example, 61 to 70, are the number of individuals that fall within this range. So if you look on the data table, Barb E. Dahl is in that range, and so is Crispy Bacon, which is 65. So we have two individuals here. In order to create a histogram or any title uh, for a chart, we got to consider the two axes. So a word of advice, what I would do is whenever you're creating a graph and you have to put a title, just say the names of the two axes, the y axes and the x axes, and put that somehow in your title. So here, if we say a title, something to do with the number of individuals in each average pulse rate range, then you have a perfect title and you can't go wrong. The next thing you want to do is you want to look at this and you want to make a determination. Do we see any patterns in this class data? Well, if it looks kind of like an arc or a bell, you are on the right track of a bell curve. A bell curve is where uh, it gets its name. It looks kind of like a bell, right? And the average or most people are going to fall in the center of the bell curve. And you do have two extremes, rares, that are uh, below or above the average, okay? And we kind of see that here with the pulse rates. Okay, so uh, one question that you could ask, you would have to, does different factors affect uh, the resting pulse rate. Here are some things like age and weight and height and activity prior to resting and eating before resting and athletes for not athletes. And believe it or not, athletes do have a lower uh, resting pulse rate because their hearts are just so strong that with every beat of the heart, it's just so efficient at pumping blood really easily through the body. And in order to uh, make any claims or links between these and pulse rate, you're going to have to have the information that is going to be available to you before the experiment to make that correlation, right? Okay, so uh, here's a question that you have to consider. How does the exercise affect your pulse rate? So what you want to do is, first of all, exercise is requiring your muscles to do work, and your muscles are going to be producing energy. So before we even answer this question, I want you guys to think about what a muscle actually needs for energy. So here's a strand of muscle fibers, and in every strand of the muscle fibers, it's made up of individual units, and each unit has muscle cells. So here's a diagram of a muscle cell. Here's our nucleus right here, and these cool looking yellow things are the mitochondria. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell, if you remember, and the mitochondria are going to make energy. In other words, they're going to make ATP. And what does it need for energy? It needs oxygen and nutrients. So it combines oxygen with nutrients to make energy for the cell. It makes ATP. Then what's going to happen is how does the oxygen and the nutrients get to the muscle cells? The faster the muscle cell works, what's going to happen is the faster the heart rate. So that's why after exercise, we usually see an increase in the heart rate because it has to deliver the oxygen and the nutrients to the muscle cells to make energy because they're actually requiring more energy for the extra work that needs to be done. So there it is. That's how the circulatory system is going to help maintain homeostasis because the muscle cells just need more energy. If you noticed, you may have 
noticed that the breathing rate increases as well during exercise. So that explains it. So that is your circulatory system pumping the blood faster and the respiratory system actually bringing in the oxygen faster to the body. So the two systems that work together, circulatory system and the respiratory system in order to maintain the energy needs for your muscle cells. Okay, part two of the lab is the squeezing the clothespin lab. It asks you to squeeze the clothespin as many times as you can in one minute. And then you take a little rest and then you do it again. Now the thing is that some people actually are able to squeeze the clothespin more time the second time, whilst other people are able to squeeze it less time. And there's two explanations. The thing with this lab is that there's no right or wrong answer. It's just how you explain it. So if you consider the anatomy of your hand, right, you have muscle cells in here, in your muscle fibers, because you're really putting them to work. You're squeezing your uh, thumb and your index finger together very rapidly. So there's two ideas. If you squeeze the clothespin more times per second, there's a logical explanation for that. So think about it in any sport. What do you do before a big competition? You stretch. What does stretching do? It actually warms up the muscles. It actually is going to increase the blood flow to the working muscles. So it's actually going to increase the efficiency of bringing the oxygen and the nutrients at a faster rate to the muscle cells. But in other situations where the people uh, do it less, you may have experienced like a burning sensation. Maybe the muscles cramped up. And in overexertion of the muscles, when um, you have muscle fatigue, you are going to build up lactic acid. You are going to have a decreased amount of oxygen throughout the body, and the muscles are going to cramp up and they're going to seize. They're going to actually it could be very painful at times. So this is a situation where actually you might be able to do less. Okay. So. Uh, the last part of the lab asks you to make claims. Making a claim is basically, can you explain it with maybe an experiment? And do you have a good explanation? So here's a question. Does exercising before squeezing a clothespin cause a person to squeeze it more times in one minute? Now, if you argue yes, you may want to argue the point that you are warming up the muscles and increasing the blood flow through your whole body, making it more efficient to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the working muscles, to those mitochondria that need oxygen and nutrients to make the energy, the ATP. If you want to argue no, you can say that you are exercising, especially if you're doing maybe vigorous exercise, you're depleting your body of the oxygen for the exercise it needs, and there may not be enough oxygen for your uh, hand muscles, and then maybe you're going to cramp up easier. Okay, So if you were to set up any experiment, there is some very important things to consider. First thing you want to do is you want to set up a control group. For example, you wouldn't just have everybody exercise before the clothespin. You would have half the group exercise, and then you would have the group not do exercise as a control group. Okay. Uh, so, for example, you would also want to minimize extra variables. So maybe keep the age group the same, for example, of the, of the people that are doing the experiment. You're not going to have a handful of people in the experiment being 90 years old and the other uh, people in the class are going to be teenagers that may affect, you know, just the ability to squeeze the clothespin. I and mean, you don't know what, ex what the extra variables are doing to the outcome of the experiment. With any experiment, you want to have a large sample size. The more uh, you have a large sample size, it's going to be more valid. It's going to be more believable. What are you going to believe, an experiment with 100 people or an experiment with two people, one person that exercises and the other one doesn't, right? You want a large sample. And of course, you, if you repeat the experiment, you are going to increase the validity or the believability of the experiment. All right, guys, that's it. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time.